A lot of people maintain that a DAC is there to reproduce digital data. No, you're not intending to reproduce the digital data. What a DAC is supposed to do is to reproduce the analog signal that was in the A to D converter before the digital data was sampled. That is what the DAC is supposed to do. Hello fellow audio nerds, I'm Steph and this is Major Hi-Fi. Can Jam this past weekend was amazing. I had so much fun and it was really, really cool to learn about so many new manufacturers and uh, products that I had never seen before, as well as really get to know and pick the brains of uh, some of the manufacturers of products that I love. So uh, I feel so refreshed and energized after coming back from that conference. In particular, one of the most interesting conversations I had the whole weekend was with Rob Watts of Cord Electronics. He has some beautiful philosophy for sound and what his goals are with his products. So it was kind of really cool to just hear his perspective and, um, and dive a little bit deeper on the technical side to some of the products that I think are awesome, like Hugo 2 and Cord Dave. Now Rob also did a seminar where he talked about Hugo and Cord Dave and you know really dug into uh, the tech side of it. Now a lot of this talk that I actually also captured uh, and filmed to share with you guys is deep. It gets into the weeds a bit and it's really technical. However, Rob is also really amazing at bringing things down to sort of the normal person level so that you can understand it even if you're not an electrical engineer. Please give this a listen if you are interested. It's super, super fascinating and there are some parts of the conversation that gets, they get deep. They get really like kind of over my head to be honest with you. But if you kind of just like push through a little bit, I think you'll walk away with some really awesome information and you'll understand uh, enough to really appreciate um, these products in a different way. So I hope you enjoy the video everybody. And here's Rob. Time domain. This is something that's got the industry in a bit of a, a stir when you're talking about pre-reading and filters and all this kind of stuff. And people talk about time domain. Um, and they invariably get it wrong, um, particularly when you're talking about NOS designs. Now, a lot of people maintain that a DAC is there to reproduce digital data, hence why no other sampling DACs seem to be quite attractive, because you're reproducing the digital data. No, you're not intending to reproduce the digital data. What a DAC is supposed to do is to reproduce the analog signal that was in the A to D converter before the digital data was sampled. That is what the DAC is supposed to do, not reproduce digital data. This is quite a different philosophy as to how most designers approach the issue. Because they think in terms of data. I don't. I think in terms of the original analog signal. I'm trying to recover the original analog signal. Conventional DACs do quite a poor job of recovering the original bandwidth limited analog signal inside the ATD converter. Um, and unfortunately, the ear and the brain is extremely sensitive to transient errors, or timing errors, non-linear timing errors. Because these are errors that constantly change. So you can have, with a transient, where the signal suddenly changes state, um, and what will happen with a regular DAC is that the timing of that changing state will either be slightly in front of where it should be, or it will be slightly behind of where it should be. And it will vary depending upon the previous data, and it will vary depending on where the sampling position was on, on that. What you need from a DAC is to recover the original transient inside the A to D converter irrespective of when the sampling period actually occurred. So you, whether you were sampling at the beginning or the end of the transient, you should get exactly the same transient recovery. The problem about transients is that transients are used by the brain in a large number of ways. Firstly, there's the interaural delay, and this is the measurement by the brain of the 
phase shift from the left to the right side. There's a bunch of neurons um, that triggered when it sees the same signal from the left ear and the right ear. Those neurons have got a resolution of about four microseconds. Some say four, some say five, some say better than 10, but it's something of that order. Clearly much better than 22 microseconds, which is what CD is. That timing information is used by the brain, part of the reasons for the brain, to determine where a sound is from left to right. It uses other things as well, obviously. The other problem is timber is very, very important. Um, when you listen to a trumpet or a piano, they've done psychoacoustics experiments where you remove the starting transient of a trumpet and the starting transient of a piano and then listen to it. And listeners find it very difficult to tell the difference, amazingly, between the sound of a trumpet and the sound of a piano. So transients are really important for you to recognize the timbre of, of an instrument. Um, it's also very important in terms of pitch. The ear is very poor at bass, for example. Um, the ear has a measuring device, it's a pretty crappy de um, design. What the brain does is it re takes that information, that limited information, and reconstructs it um, and processes the information to, to get you to hear what you actually perceive as, as what you're hearing. One of the problems with bass is that you, it's very difficult for the ear to measure the pitch of a bass note. And it determines the pitch of a bass note, of a bass guitar, for example, from a starting transient. So again, if you remove the starting transient of a bass guitar, you can't follow the bass, bass rhythm at all. So transients are very important in terms of your perception of the music. It will change how you perceive imagery, it will change how you perceive the timbre of the instruments, and it will change how you perceive pitch and bass. So it's pretty crucial. So how do we reconstruct the original timing information? How do we get the original transient that was from one sample to the next sample and recover the timing? That's down to something called the interpolation filter. And an interpolation filter is inside every single DAC. Now we know from theory um, that you can perfectly recover a bandwidth limited signal and it will make no difference whether you are sampling at 22 microseconds or 2 picoseconds. You can perfectly recover the signal if you use something called a sync function filter. The problem with a sync function is it needs an infinite amount of time. This ringing occurs right to positive infinity and to negative infinity, right into the future and right into the past. So to use a sync function filter, you will need to wait an infinite period of time and have an infinite amount of processing power, which is not really very desirable. <laughs> um, well, what I found when I started to play with this, um, I knew from my original tests with, with digital theory that this transient problem was going to be a major issue with, with digital audio. When FPGA started to get better so that I could actually do my own interpolation filters way back in 99, I started experimenting with tap lengths. And I found that if I increased the tap length, it did sound better. Um, so going from a, a regular 128 taps to 256 taps to then 2048 taps, um, I could hear a change in sound quality. And it did pretty much what I expected. The bass became better defined. Imagery became sharper and more natural. Instrument separation and timber became better. So these are things that you'd expect from properly reconstructing transit information. But I knew that to get 16-bit performance in terms of your sync function, so that when these ringing goes, goes below 16 bits, you would need a million taps. And a million taps was completely impossible um, in the 90s. Um, I figured, well, there must be a way of improving the transit recovery from the algorithm itself, rather than relying on lots of taps. I started experimenting and doing listening tests and playing with things and understanding what was going on in terms of the, the, the transit recovery. And I found that, yes, you could improve the performance by changing the algorithm. And I optimized my algorithm so that it would recover the timing information more efficiently. 
what I ended up finding was that a 256 WTA filter sounded better than a 2048 half band conventional filter. So that I got at least a 10 to 1 improvement in performance by changing the WTA algorithm itself. So here's, here's history on, on what I've been doing on, in, in terms of tap length. With the DAC64, I had four FPGAs all running together to create a thousand taps. Um, so we, I was pretty limited in those days. And the thing got quite hot, I think it was 15 watts just to do a thousand taps. Well, also the noise shaping and the SP diff recovery and all that kind of stuff. The FPGAs were quite, quite inefficient and quite small. Then with Hugo, I got to 26,000 taps which was a huge change in sound quality. Um, again, Hugo was an 8FS filter, like the DAC64 was an 8FS filter. With Dave, with this 10 times better um, FPGA, I managed to get 264,000 taps. Every time I increased the sound, uh, sorry, the tap length, the sound quality got better. Um, it was something a bit surprising, because when I went from Hugo to Dave, even though I increased it by five times or so, it took nine months to code this thing and get the thing to work. I actually did get a huge change. It was an important change, but it wasn't night and day, it was just regular improvement. So I was kind of thinking, you know, 164,000 taps were probably getting close to the end of the, of the limit here. Then a new FPGA became available. Um, and actually, they Zynix launched this thing in 2012, but they actually only made it available about 18 months ago, um, which is normal in Zynix. They tell you that they're going to produce something. In the semiconductor business, they call it vaporware. Um, so it's a data sheet, and that's all it is. Um, and, um, but this thing became available. This has got 740 DSP cores inside it. Um, and 16 megabits of memory, um, and 215,000 logic cells. It's a lot of gates. Um, so how many taps can we do with this FPG? Well, you already know the answer. A million taps. Now, a million taps to me was obviously very important. And going back to when I was at university, and I was listening to vinyl, because that's all we had in the 1980s, early 1980s. <laughs> Vinyl digital recordings became available on vinyl. Um, and my first, I think the first digital recording I got was the Telarc 1812, which had enormous wheels and huge great cannons. It was quite spectacular. Um, anyway, listening to, to early digital was quite interesting. At first, I was very impressed. But then I found that actually I didn't enjoy listening to the music. I much preferred my old analog deco pressings. Um, and I found that there was a glassiness and an edginess of the sound, and it was flat, and there was something quite wrong with it, and I ended up stopping buying digital. At that time, I was learning about Shannon, um, Whitaker Shannon interpolation theory and sampling theory and all that kind of stuff, and they were talking about sync functions, and I was also studying um, privately about physiology of hearing. Um, and I knew that transits were very, very important conceptually. And I also realized that if we didn't have a sync function filter, we would have timing errors because of the 22 microseconds. And we need much better performance than 22 microseconds. And that these would be important subjectively. So I felt that was the reason why digital sounded so shit. I was wrong. It was shit because of other reasons, as well as this. <laughs> um, which is why I ended up designing my own DAX, because I could solve the other, the other reasons. But nonetheless, this problem of, of transient timing recovery is a major, major issue. But I worked out on the back of an envelope. I thought, right, we've got 16-bit CD. The CD started to come along in 84. 16-bit CD. Let's look at the sync function. Let's say it falls to below 16 bits and we ignore the coefficients at below 16 bits, throw them away, and just use a 16 bit sync function. How many taps do we need? And it came out to be a million taps. 
1980s, a million taps. <laughs> we didn't even have FIR filters, it was just inductors and capacitors. This was impossible. This was always going to be impossible. Um, so the million taps was actually quite a big, a, a big thing for me personally, because it's a lifetime goal to hit the million taps. What I found was when I did the, the FPGA, because I heard with Dave, not a huge change going from 26,000 taps to 64,000 taps. Because it took me nine months to design three different filters and then eventually got place and routing and coding to work, I didn't want that headache. And this was a little project for, to upgrade the blue, didn't want to spend a great deal of time, so I thought, okay, I'm just going to do 512,000 taps, easy to do, easy to place and route, I'm guaranteed to get timing, um, it's going to work. So designed it, took about three months, plugged it in, listened to it, jaw dropped. It was probably one of the most surprising things I'd ever heard, in that the sound was completely different. And I thought, WTF, this is, this is weird, this is bizarre. So then I started to think, oh God, I've got an FPGA that's got all this capacity. It's almost capable of doing a million taps. I want to do a million taps because this is what I've always wanted to do. But uh, I've got to redesign everything and I'm going to run out of memory because the memory's not very efficient and how the hell am I going to figure that problem out? And I'm going to get time enclosure problems and I'm going to have to tell John Franks that his project's going to get delayed. I've got to redesign everything. And, uh, but he's got no choice. He has to follow what I say. <laughs> so I told him, I'm going to delay this, and it's only going to take three months. Don't worry about it. We're going to have a million taps. And, you know, from a marketing point of view, you can sell it much better by saying it's a million taps. You say, oh, yeah, yeah, a million taps sounds much better than 512,000. Yeah, yeah, OK, it's no problem. What I didn't tell him was all the problems that I was going to have, and I wasn't sure I was going to be able to do it. So I pushed, pushed the button, and it was really worth it. But I had a lot of trouble, and it did, it did take longer than three months. Um, but this just gives you an idea of the complexity involved in this. It's To do a million taps, it's a half a million lines of code. That's a lot for one person to do. Um, when you consider that a Windows is only 10 million lines of code, and this is 5% of a Windows operating system, using thousands of, of engineers to design it, it's just me. And when you design the, the architecture and write the code, you don't know whether it's going to place and root. You don't know whether you're going to get time enclosure. You can only do rough stabs and see, is it going to get time enclosure? You need time enclosure so that the thing will actually work. So that all the delays in the routing, the output works and it gives you the correct data and doesn't give you something that's it's, it's mangling in the middle. So time enclosure is a really, really important function. When you're coding for FPGAs or hardware, you spend most of your time on testing and simulation, not actually coding. Because it's the testing and the simulation work that is, accounts for two thirds of the effort. Only a third is spent on coding. Um, and it's even particularly a problem with, with FPGAs because of the placing and routing that you have to do. Um, and sometimes it can take hours and you find that it's impossible to place it. Biggest problem, didn't turn out to be time enclosure, which I thought it was. It was actually memory. I ran out of memory, and it wasn't because there was enough memory on the device, it was because the memory wasn't very efficient. Um, when you're in encoding the memory, you use blocks of, of modules of, of memory, and you can only use, you don't, can't use 100% of it, we use what I was originally doing, 50% of the memory. So I come up with a way of making the memory more efficient. So come up with this strategy. And this is where there's one memory block and one coefficient block to feed eight DSP cores. And then each eight DSP cores has got its own threads running through. So this module here is here, and you can see all the number of modules running through. Um, and then they all end up at the end, um, where you accumulate and add up all the numbers together. Um, this actually worked out very well because when I'm, most of your time you're spending on coding is actually encoding the memory coefficients. So putting these blocks as eight units meant that I reduced the amount of time I was writing things and transferring data by a factor of eight. So that turned out to be quite a nice way of doing it in terms of how fast it took me to write the code. So why did we 
uses 200 T in a day. Um, and the problem with this is the amount of noise that's been generated by these 528 DSP cores injecting noise into the ground plane. And the noise is signal correlated, so it bears some relationship to the actual signal. And we were talking earlier about minus 350 dB performance, so anything that's slightly signal correlated will degrade your depth perception. And you get the maximum noise when it switches over from zero to, to from minus one to plus one. So that, I mean, the LSB minus one, so it's been the smallest signal, you get the maximum noise. So this is a, a real problem. So having the upsampler or the M scaler separate to Dave means that this noise gets kept in a different chassis and it's isolated and the galvanically isolated too. Galvanic isolation turned out to be quite a major headache. In fact, that, that accounted for two different prototypes because I wanted to improve the sound quality because I found it was very, very sensitive to, to how the isolation was done. So, and there's another M scaler that's, that I've been working on. And I'm not allowed to talk about that. Um, so, M scaler. We're finally getting 16 bit performance in terms of recovering track the timing information to 16-bit accuracy that was in the HD converter. It's easily the most advanced um, filter technology. To me, it redefines CD performance, and you, you can ignore the nonsense that I talk about. You only need to see posters of people that bought the Bluetooth um, to see how different the thing actually is. And it is quite astounding how different the change in sound quality is. Um, I, when you're designing, you, you suffer from tunnel vision because you're working on this little project. And you're not dealing, I'm not working with anybody else, it's just me doing my listing tests. And sometimes my sons get involved in listing tests, but you know, it's me that's just doing it. And August, September, when I first heard the 512,000 taps, and I thought, wow, this is amazing, this sounds so much better. Very, very excited. Kind of thought that, you know, maybe I was just being oversensitive because I've heard this so many times and that sort of thing. It really wasn't that significant. You don't know until somebody else listens to it as well. And then when I went to the million taps, we had the million taps working, um, I think it was Christmas Eve, um, I had the million taps working. CES last, not last CES, but the CES before was when we were launching it. So nobody had heard it at CES, um, and um, Jude was the second person to hear it, apart from myself. Even the guys at Cord hadn't heard it, because I hadn't demoed it to them, I hadn't timed it for them to demo it. So we, we didn't have, I came to the show, I didn't have any CDs, so I borrowed a CD from somebody, and uh, it was a Wigmore Hall, I think the Wigmore Hall we call it, I had an underground, so you hear the subway the rumble on the subway trains as it started off. And first three seconds, I just looked at June, and June looked at me and went, you could hear the rumble of the subway train. It was completely different. Really bizarre. And then I thought, uh-uh. Your excitement about this being really significant was true, and that actually it it was so easy to hear the change, because this is the first time I've done it with other people. I realized that this was much bigger than even I thought it was. Um, but it wasn't tunnel vision. I was actually not seeing how big a change this thing actually makes. So yes, it, it, makes, it makes a huge difference. Thank you, everybody, so much for watching. I hope you had a wonderful weekend this past weekend. And um, if you didn't make it to Can Jam, um, I know that there's going to be a bunch of awesome reviews of the products that we're all sort of curious about. Um, be sure to check out the Major Hi-Fi blog. That's where I'm posting a lot of the reviews for the products that I personally listen to. Um, so if you keep your eyes on there, you'll get to see what some of my thoughts were on those products. Anyway, everybody, I hope you have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Peace.